That's Mike. That's Toya, and this is Tech Beats and Bites. All right, all right. So, Toya, how you doing? Um, you had a little mishap. You had a little headache. Couldn't get on the show. That's what, <laughs> happened. That's what happened when you get on HSN and you all famous and stuff. <laughs> Don't be coming for me. No, I'm better. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I mean, you got to do it. I can't afford you, so you got to make that money somehow. <laughs> how you be? Where you at? You dragging. It's the first time ever you froze. What's going on? Oh, well, we're down here at our parents. This is um, videotape court headquarters of everything wow. that we're doing. So all three of us are here. So everybody got stuff going on. That's what happened when you're famous. You got the extra house to go to. That you <laughs> to. <laughs> so um, today we wanted to get, uh, of course, it's becoming time to vote. We're about 20 days out from the open primaries in Miami-Dade County. And mm -hmm. we want to bring on our uh, political expert, uh, Dwight Bullard. And we also want to have an opportunity to talk with the Democratic candidate for the Miami-Dade County uh, State Attorney, which is uh, Attorney Melba Pearson. So mm -hmm. wanted to just get some perspective of just the climate of the world. Also, to have a little fun with these guys. They always have to be serious. So we want to try to have some better conversations so people can get to know both of them as humans because they have huge impact in our community. So uh, Dante, can you bring on our guests? So we have Dwight Bullard and we have Melba Pierce. How are you guys doing? Good, how y'all doing? We're doing Good. great. You know, doing great. I feel a little undereducated because Melba got books behind her. I just got, <laughs> I got this dope. I got this dope print to show my creative side. Shout out to Larry Poncho Brown. Melba got the whole uh Melba got the whole Congress library back there. Right. <laughs> that is all actually the, all the statues. Books. <laughs> it's all his encyclopedias, like full sets. Remember back in the day when you used to like get oh, way back in the day? when yeah. the almost like the uh Jehovah Witnesses used to come by selling them at your door. <laughs> That's right. <I'm, laughs> shout out to the people who don't have the full alphabet in their collection. Who only got right. A, A, R, and P. Right. Circa nineteen ninety five, because nothing's changed, bro. <laughs> Man, good hey, old times. Don't you see? I'm trying to watch my Saturday cartoons. Ain't nobody trying to learn nothing. Quick. <laughs> got better things to do. Email <laughs> on. Hit me back, bro. <laughs> so, um, guys, I, I think most people know who you are, but we've learned. Out of respect and humbleness, you uh, never take for granted what people do know and don't know about you. So if you would, uh, and also for a legal disclaimer, um, Dwight Bullard is in no way, shape, or form on this show to endorse Melba Pearson, and Melba Pearson is in no way, shape, or form endorsing anything with the new Florida majority. They yeah. are just two amazing people that are on this show at the same time. <laughs> so, all right. So uh, if you guys could, and ladies first, uh, Miss Pearson. <laughs> Hey, Dwight, I can't get you fired, bro. I, I appreciate, appreciate that, man. Thank you. You be calling me like, hey, bro, uh, unemployment ain't working out. You got some money over there? <laughs> so, Listen. So, Melba, if you could, I please. I need it, baby. Turn your tears, then I'm sorry. <laughs> I just need about 600 more dollars for a couple more months. <laughs> oh, <bro. laughs> We're going to be waiting until December. Right. <laughs> that money ain't never coming. Um, Attorney Pearson, if you could, please tell the people a little bit about yourself and you don't have to rush it. We have an hour on the show, and this is really to inform people today. Awesome. So again, super excited to be on with everyone this afternoon. My name is Melba Pearson. I'm running to be the next state attorney for Miami-Dade County, Florida. I was a prosecutor in that same office for close to 16 years. And then I also served as president of the National Black Prosecutors Association, which was a really amazing experience. And then I then served as the deputy director for the ACLU of Florida, spent about three years in that role, working on 
on voting rights, especially Amendment 4 that gave voting rights back to people who had completed uh, t their time in the criminal justice system. And then also working on criminal justice reform, immigration issues, especially how it impacts communities of color. And now I'm a full-time candidate hanging out with y'all and, you know, <laughs> you getting to have a, a fun discussion for the next hour before I start making fundraising phone calls again. And so far, I understand of the people out there, not to be counting your coins, but from my understanding, you left a six-figure job to try to save Miami-Dade County. That is absolutely correct. Six-figure job with 401k benefits, all that good stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Dwight's like, could we do your analysis again, please? <laughs> what do we so, think? Mr. Bully, I need you to do me a favor. You are not going to be in a position to just tell people what you're doing now. You need right. to tell them why we call you Senator Bully so they understand that. Please tell them <laughs> what you've done and what you're doing and what you plan on doing in the upcoming future. Got it. Got it. Well, uh, Dwight Bullard, um, you know, in a in an ironic situation, I left a low five figure job as a public school teacher uh, to take an even lower five figure job as a state senator. <laughs> um, no, no, in all seriousness, uh, yeah, I was a public school teacher for 17 years, and then uh, 2008 decided to run for a state house. Uh, won that, served two terms in the state house from 08 to 12, and then served a term in the uh, Florida Senate from uh, 2012 to 2016. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, just, you know, to, to, to stay on the money theme, you know, when you're not making no money, it, you just, you go into and, and have no problem uh, kind of telling people how you feel. So I appreciate the freedom that, that, that did, that, that brought me as a public school teacher and as a public servant in that regard. Uh, since then, I'd be, uh, the political director at an organization called the New Florida Majority, based here in Miami, but we also work in four other counties around the uh, state of Florida, doing everything from electoral work, civic engagement work, you know, just really trying to help uh, predominantly black and brown people understand and know their own power. And uh, always a big fan of Tech Beats and Bites from all the variations, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, out in the streets of Wynwood when it was uh, live on stage or, or, you know, in the studios of the CIC building <laughs> right. back in the day or now in the virtual space. I'm always happy to be here with my fellow Killian Cougar, Toy, <laughs> Toy Sturm, and of course, Michael Hall. Good, good see you. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Michael Hall. <laughs> I mean, if you were killing Cougar, I'd shot y'all too, but you know. <laughs> that just ain't my thing. You got it. I just, it ain't my thing. <laughs> I'm a panhandle boy. We much different. We only had three high schools when I was growing up. That is. That is. <laughs> so there's some things I want to jump into real quick. And I do feel we have a educated group of people that watch our show. But I have heard something lately that was disturbing to me. And it was some from very successful and powerful people I know. And the statement went a little bit like this. Man, they need to get rid of Ben Crump. He'll never win. Um, can you guys please do me the justice of uh, legal 101 and explain to people the difference between a state attorney, prosecutor, and a civil attorney so that the people out there can understand that uh, Bill Crump hasn't lost since 1999, and he don't talk unless it's less, uh, over a million dollars. He's won for every family he's defended. So can you guys please explain the difference between a state attorney and a uh, civil attorney, please? Sure. I mean, I can, guess I could start off with that one. Uh, so first of all, we have to be very clear about there's two different systems when, when it comes to law, right? There's the civil system and there's the criminal system. Civil is all about the money. Right. It to quote notorious BID is all about the money, right? So the reality is it's okay, you and I have a beef. I'm going to sue you and I'm gonna to prove to the court that this is your fault and you're gonna give me money in return. That's like the easiest explanation for the civil system. The criminal system is if you lose, you go to jail. <laughs> so that's you know, so you know, civil is about money, criminal is about liberty, 
And so a prosecutor, a state attorney, so back up, a prosecutor can be called a state attorney, a district attorney, a commonwealth attorney, depending on what state you're in. Right. Different states have different terminology for it. A prosecutor is the person that brings charges on behalf of your particular state because somebody has committed a crime. Now, Ben Crump is a civil attorney, right? All he does is specialize in lawsuits. And I don't mean all is in a derogatory way, but that's his main focus. That's his area of specialty. So he is not involved in the criminal system at all. He is about filing lawsuits against different police departments in different cities for the deaths of unarmed black men. That's what, again, that's been his specialty. And he's been very successful at it. So you can have a situation where the police officer doesn't get arrested for a, a shooting an unarmed person, but that police department or that city that houses that police department ends up paying the family three, $4 million. And of course he gets 30% of that. So, you know, and just because people don't always see that end result, no settlements happen. So. And so, uh, I, I just I wanted to play, go ahead. I want to play a game with you before you answer real quick. We weren't able to make a graphic, but the game is called name that attorney. So the uh -oh. answer is either state attorney or civil attorney. Okay. Who prosecuted George Zimmerman? <laughs> state attorney. Okay. State Who's attorney Angela Corey. Angela Corey. Put the phone attorney, in Angela, the yeah, State <laughs> attorney Angela Corey out of Jacksonville. Who's <laughs> prosecuting the killers of Ahmaud Arbery? District attorney number four? Yeah. <laughs> in, 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 in Georgia. Okay. In Georgia. Who needs to prosecute and bring to trial the killers of Breonna Taylor? Uh, Attorney General Daniel Cameron <laughs> of the of the state of Kentucky, if the uh, if the uh, district attorney for Louisville does not step, not doing. All right, so you were three for three, amazing job. Um, basically, people, I want y'all to understand: being Crump don't lose. He may settle. He may make it public. Most of the time, they can't discuss it, as in most settlements. You cannot discuss the terms of the settlement and the amount settled. Sometimes it leaks out. Sometimes they want to put it out so they can say, hey, we actually did care about this issue. Leave us alone. We know we messed up. But uh, being Crump, don't lose. So I just want you guys to see that Dwight got every one of those questions. And Melba, they had it absolutely right. Being Crump is not your prosecutor. Quit telling people that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dwight. Just want to get that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to like highlight some examples of that and to the point uh, that you made, like for a lot of folks, uh, especially who remember the OJ trial, you remember Johnny Cochran right. and the role Johnny Co Cochran played. So Johnny Cochran was both a criminal defense attorney as well as a civil litigant. So he did go out and seek, uh, you know, money for families, but also uh, defended people. And I think that's where people get it conflated about what Ben Crump does. Uh, what happens in the case of Mike Brown, or uh, you know Kendrick Johnson in Georgia, these families will hire an attorney to seek a civil settlement settlement from whoever the wrongdoing uh, was, whoever created the wrongdoing, whether it was the state, whether it was a city, whether it was a school, whether it was a you know someone else committing a crime against that family member, but the person responsible for bringing the charges. So in the case of Mike Brown, the reason people got frustrated was because, you know, the, the district attorney in Ferguson or St. Louis County was supposed to be responsible for bringing charges against uh, the police officer in that case. Um, and because they did not do their job, they were also unelected <laughs> mm -hmm. subsequently, right? So uh, right after Mike Brown, what a lot of people don't know is that they elected a new district attorney uh, in Ferguson, they elected a new district attorney in St. Louis County. Um, and and these folks have been doing a lot of real, real serious work around criminal justice and criminal legal reform in their state. So you're talking about uh, St. Louis having done almost like a complete 180 mm -hmm. from where it was in 2014 to where it is now. Yeah. Just want to bring that up. That unpacking was real, and you made a great point because we often get frustrated uh, looking at the in the electric, new district.
Go ahead. <laughs> no, Corey, you're good. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Because I was hearing um, feedback. It was the echo, yeah, it was the feedback. Gotcha. So no, I was going to say great unpacking because a lot of times us looking at the media, we react to what we're seeing, not understanding the process. So for us to truly see the results that we need, you made a great point. It's about elections, right? Putting the right people in office who can then carry out the results that we want to see. So let's talk a little bit about that because one of the things, Melba, that's what you're running for. It's to be the person that can help put some of these changes in place. Yeah, for sure. So I think people are really getting their minds around the power of a prosecutor as a result of the horrible trifecta that we've been through in the last few months, being Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, as well as George Floyd. And then, of course, Elijah McCain came up, you know, recently. But again, this was a case that happened maybe a year or so ago. But people are actually realizing, like, wait a minute. So the prosecutor AKA the state attorney, district attorney, is the person who can prosecute those cops? Oh, wait, let me look in my own backyard to see whether or not my elected prosecutor is aligned with my values and takes these cases seriously and is really pushing for equity and justice. And especially here in Miami, people are waking up to realize, oh, wait, my opponent, the incumbent for the last 27 years, has never filed charges against a police officer for an on-duty killing. Hmm, okay, that's problematic, right? So now people are starting to get more engaged and educate themselves around the power of a prosecutor. And of course, it's more than just police shootings, it's about priorities. Are you going to prioritize violent crime or are you going to prioritize putting somebody in jail over a joint, right? Are you going to prioritize rehabilitation or are you about let's send people to prison and use that as a fix for all that ail society, which we know that that does not work, right? That that was very like Reagan era, tough on crime, throw everybody in, in prison and that's supposed to fix things. It, it, you know, prison doesn't fix addiction. Prison doesn't fix mental illness, right? Programs do. So that's, you know, part of the reason why I'm running is just to make sure that, first of all, these issues are raised and really that people have someone who's going to be an advocate for them, who's going to fight for more social services, who's going to fight for rehabilitation as opposed to just pure punishment and really prioritize the needs of the community and of all the community, not just, oh, I'm going to hook up the wealthy over here and create two systems of justice so that the poor people are not able to have their voice be heard or be able to fight whatever charges that were, you know, alleged against them, right? So... That's kind of how I look at the issue. So I think going along with what Latoya said, and I remember one specific situation being at the Fort Lauderdale City Commission and the CRA meeting. And I just remember them coming in and they're saying, oh, we're putting aside X amount of dollars because we want to make sure we have the revival pen or whatever the pen was to bring people back when they've overdosed with opioids. And um, we will focus on not getting them into prison, but making sure we get them into rehab. Mm -hmm. And I was literally sick to my stomach and I had to get up and walk out. And Dante came out and he said, what's wrong? I was like, they didn't do that for black people when crack was a problem. Uh, they didn't do that for black people when heroin was a problem. But now we're taking away a whole structure of funding, which in theory, it is a good thing to do, like you said, to not just put people in jail. But it seemed blatantly apparent that since this was more of a middle class, upper class white problem of people getting turned out by opioids, they were willing to help them versus just putting them in prison. So when you speak of different programs in two different systems, I'm just curious, how do we, besides being able to have artificial intelligence to actually prosecute cases where you can't see race and you can only look at the data, how do we actually break down this systematic racism when it comes to justice? And that's an open question for both of you guys. Dwight, I'll let you go first since I. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that, and that that's a that's a super loaded question, but it's it's really at the core of the work that we're trying to do, which is like deconstruct the mythology around criminalization of race, criminalization of poverty, criminalization of, of ability, um, because that's been, that's been a cornerstone of what we've had up to this point, right? I mean, let's call it what it is. Um, 
you know, when certain people uh, talk about making America great again, um, America has never had this notion of greatness because it's always operated at the expense of somebody. You know, there's always been an exploitation or a mistreatment or uh, a lack of empathy for some group of people, hence why we've had the past policy. You know, like the Americans with Disabilities Act is just celebrating its 30th anniversary, which means prior to 1990, you could openly discriminate against people with a physical handicap, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, the Loving case in 1967 was what uh, allowed uh, for interracial couples to, to marry in, in 1967, but that also set up the precedent for uh, gay marriage uh, legality in the, in the, in the mid 2000s. And so it's those kinds of things that people have to be mindful of that we have to constantly work to deconstruct, to dismantle and to break down things that have been, um, you know, blatant irregularities, blatant racist problems in the infrastructure of the United States. I was on a call last week where, uh, you know, uh, someone at the ACLU, you know, where, where, where Melba's organization we worked at before, you know, broke down something that should be very simple for people in terms of basic American history. When the rules of the game were set, the only people allowed are sitting at the table were old, rich, white men. Right. That's, that's who the so-called founding fathers were, right? Like old, rich, white. Mind you, regular white guys didn't have access to the ballot box. Or to rule making, you know, what I mean, you literally had to be those three things in order to do that. So everything that we've done, uh, you know, subsequently since then has been to add more people into a process that was broken from its onset or exclusionary from its onset um, and making sure people have access to all the things that they are deserving of as uh, full participants in this in this democracy, and so, yeah, that's that's things we have to do. That is that is what we have to do. That is the work we have to do on a consistent basis, because it wasn't built to be inclusionary. It was built by its very design to be exclusionary. And so, when we talk about the, these two justice systems that Melba speaks about, it's the fact that black people have been criminalized in the state of Florida. 1868, they put a law in place that says you cannot vote for the rest of your life if you've been convicted of a felony. And then the immediate first felony they passed after that was vagrancy. So you have a population of people who just been released, freed from the bondages of slavery. They basically say, all right, well, we see two things are out there. A, you're black, we don't want you to vote. B, you don't have homes. So we're going to criminalize homelessness, right? And from that point on, for 150 years, we allowed that to sit in, in place. And then in 2018, we had to vote to literally have that taken out of our Constitution and struck it for our Constitution. So this work is consistent and constant. And, we, and that's the message I want to send to folks is that you can't just take your ball and go home because you've got your rights or because you're, you're in a comfortable or privileged position you really have to be cognizant of how other folks are being impacted by this system. Melba? Yeah, and, and also we have to really change the narrative around the concept of safety, right? So people often equate money to safety. So if you have to pay, you know, $10,000 to get out on bond before your case goes to trial, that means you're not going to commit another crime. And that means you're not going to you know, flee the jurisdiction in advance of your case. And you're going to show up for trial and all of that good stuff. We know that that's not the case, but people still have that mindset going on. So as we start to explore bail reform and that concept of focusing on risk, whether or not someone's an actual risk to the community, as opposed to how much money they have in their pockets, in their bank account or under their mattress, you know, again, it, 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 you have to switch up that narrative in order for us to be able to push these changes forward. But people just get all twisted about it, especially 
And, and I mean, the, the most recent examples that I think bring it home are like your Jeffrey Epstein's, your Harvey Weinstein's, even R. Kelly, no matter how you feel about him. At the end of the day, when he got out of custody, he went back to his lifestyle, which involved underage girls. Right. So and, and that is sexual assault. So, you know, people are very focused on money, 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 money. That's the only way to assure safety. But that's clearly not the case. So it's all about really re-educating people and reframing the narrative to talk about safety in terms of access to programming, addressing underlying issues that got you into the system, reducing recidivism through making sure people are able to work, right? You know, so, there, so there's so many components that do intersect with social services. So that's why voters have to be super educated, not just on state attorney's races, but on the legislature's races, on your mayor's race, on your county commissioner because they're the ones who set the budget and decide how much money is going to go towards local and municipal programs that can address some of these issues versus not. Yeah. And one of the things that to build on top of this conversation as an extremely polarizing topic is defunding the police, right? Because that's talking about using funds and shifting it and moving it. But it's being framed in such, in such a way to where it's forcing people to look at it differently. So if y'all could unpack exactly what that conversation is and what the goal of defunding the police is. So then that way uh, people can truly understand what the conversation should be about. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you used the term polarizing because uh, it has been, but it should not be, right? right? Um, when Melba talks about how we view safety in this, uh, in this context, we have to think about how the system currently exists, what we use it for, and, and then reimagining how it could work even more efficiently for people. So I want to, th you know, talk about what the system does now, right? I don't want to make it very simple for folks. When someone dials 911, right, on their phone, and they say that my grandfather is suffering from a heart attack, uh, more than likely, 95% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, an ambulance is going to come by your house, an EMT is going to come by your house because that's a health-related issue. Um, if you say that my grandfather is being attacked uh, by somebody uh, down the street, I, I see someone with a gun, and you call 911 and you say this, you're going to get, again, a response by law enforcement. But here's the thing. If you say that my son is currently going through a manic depressive moment and I need someone uh, to come help my son, who should be responding to that versus who is responding to that becomes the essential question around this notion of defunding the police, right? What should happen should be that someone with crisis counseling, someone with a mental health background, someone with a social work background, should be dispatched to your home to help deal with that issue. And the reason I give that example is because if your son was in school having a manic attack, a school resource officer would not show up. <laughs> the principal wouldn't show up. No, a special education teacher would show up. Mm -hmm. uh, a paraprofessional would show up. Someone with a level of expertise in how to deal with someone with special needs, right? Yet we have a system where outside of the school space, that does not exist. So when we talk about this notion of what defunding or the reallocation of resources means, it means that we want a system of safety that works to benefit those that are feeling the most impacted and affected by that. A, and then a reinvestment of resources into the communities that have been most detrimentally impacted by an unjust law enforcement system. And that's, that's the key here, is that the system of policing that has existed in this country has been void of humanity in particular communities. And we say like, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that if I lived in Pinecrest and I was white, I could run around naked outside. <laughs> I could do backflips back and forth. I could smoke crack on my front porch. And guess what's probably gonna happen? Nothing. <laughs> because the neighbors next door would be like, guess what? That's their right. They can do whatever they want to. We have laws in the state that allow, up until a few years ago, allow people to put shooting ranges in their backyard legally, <laughs> right? Which means you can put a sack of potatoes up, put a target on it, and start shooting at it. And if somebody said that's wrong, you would be like, that's my rights. <laughs> I can do it. But you have entire zip codes and communities throughout the state of Florida and the country 
that know exactly what jump out day is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can ask a 12 year old kid in Liberty City, which day of the week is jump out day? And they will tell you what day jump out day is. And jump out day is the day that police militarize and mobilize into particular communities for the purposes of arresting and harassing people in those communities. White children don't get that. They've never understood that, they never would, and they shouldn't have to. But guess what? Neither should a 12-year-old black kid at the end of the day. Neither should a 12-year-old Latino kid. But the fact that we have that gross inequity just on zip code alone means that the system is not functioning. Well, let me take that back. The system is functioning the way it was designed, but it is not functioning the way it should. And so when we talk about defunding the police or re reallocation of resources, it's that. It's that you've robbed particular communities of resources for far too long and you need to reinvest. And then you need to reimagine the notion of what public safety looks like based on, again, the way the system has already been designed. I should be able to pick up the phone and say that, you know, my cousin is, is feeling depressed and is in need of help and I cannot manage that and know that my cousin will not be shot after I make that phone call, that my cousin will receive the help that they deserve after I send that phone call. And if we can't do that, or people can't just imagine that to be a thing, then you need to kind of revisit your own humanity, but understand that that is what we're working for when we, when we hear the term defund. Melba? Yeah, and, and, and you know everything that Dwight said is right on point. I really like that explanation with regards to 911. A lot of times I was thinking about it in the context of the other number we have, 311, which really is designed just for services. But the, theoretically, the two should be merged together if there's a possible way to do that without overtaxing you know, our system. And of course, that could take more money. That could be you know diverted from certain budgets. But you know, I think what why this topic becomes so polarizing is that some people frame it as a discussion about abolishing the police. Right. That is a separate discussion. And too often people jump right to the extreme of, oh my gosh, you know, all they want to do is abolish the police. And that's why we have these ridiculous ads. I haven't seen it, but I've heard these ads are running about, oh yes, this is 911. No one is available to take your call. If you're being raped, please press one. If you're being murdered, please press two, right? Like it's ludicrous. And I don't think that is what the majority of people are advocating. Right. I look at it from my perspective as a former prosecutor. I remember too many times I'd receive a file and I'm like, OK, this person clearly needs drug rehab treatment. Um, you know, based on what they did, they're going to have to maybe go to prison for a little while. But there used to be a really great drug rehab program in prison. So I was like, all right, let me make sure to refer them to this program so that when they get out, at least, you know, I know the conviction thing is a whole other issue when it comes to getting a job, but at least you might be clean, right? So that at least is a step in the right direction. I started to refer the person and they're like, oh no, Miss Pearson, you didn't know? That program just got cut. And I was like, oh. And so I've had that experience so many times over my prosecutorial career. And what always happens is that there's budget cuts. And then when we're flush again, nobody goes back and restores the funding to those programs. Mm -hmm. They just moving forward and then they say, oh wait, crime's up, let's put more money towards the police budget and not think about what are some of the reasons why crime may be increasing in certain in certain areas? Is it about enforcement or is it about prevention? Because like my dad always said, prevention is better than the cure. And the criminal justice system is a blood force instrument and it's used to just basically smash and punish which it shouldn't be that way, but that's how it's been working. So we really have to re-examine as a country, as a state, as a community, what we want to prioritize. Because show me your budget and I'll tell you what your priorities are. And if you're not prioritizing social services, prevention, mental health services, addiction services, then your priorities are just incarcerating people and not truly having safer communities. So when you start talking about uh, the uh, I would say the trolls when they get into statements like Mark Marxists and extremists. Do you actually feel these statements are coming from the lack of information, or just the pure hatred of not wanting to understand the information? I don't 
think anybody has an excuse with regards to lack of information because there's this thing called Google, right? Like you don't even need to be like back in the books like this. Like you literally can type in three words into your browser and get all the information you need. So there's not a lack of information. I think there's a lot of the number one polarization, which is I only watch these news outlets and whatever they tell me is the gospel. Right. right. And then there is that hatred already there that if you're not, you know, first of all, they're hating on you because of your color. So half the time, these discussions that are happening aren't, oh, my gosh, you know, you're this, you know, white liberal or whatever. It's usually a person of color. They're wanting to tell about your lived experience. They want to lecture you about your lived experience. So, you know, you, you have that extremist, because I don't want to say supremacy, thank you, Mike, but you have this extremist perspective that certain people are already inferior, and you should just be happy, like a Colin Kaepernick. You should just be happy to be in the room. Don't bother to talk about your problems or your injustices here because we don't care about it. So I think a lot of it is just a lack of a desire to have accurate information and basically wanting to paint yourself as better than other people as opposed to really being open to listen and work in partnership to find a solution. And I think to piggyback on that, I think it's also the fact that there are people who benefit from the system as, as is, right? Uh, or those who, who uh, you know, have just never experienced that, that inequity, right? So when people talk about this happening disproportionately with Black and Latinx folks, if you're not or don't identify in those spaces, uh, you know, so you haven't had a run in with the police, you haven't, you know, had a gun pulled on you, you haven't been pulled over for driving while black, you haven't been in one of these communities that that suffers at the hands of uh, militarized or aggressive law enforcement. You know, you're thinking everything's hunky dory. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, the three times I've had to call the police, they showed up, uh, you know, 10 minutes later, they filled out the report and everything is fine, you know. So why, why are people complaining about this thing? And that comes from a position of privilege and people need to like, you know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes or more importantly, understand and identify with what the plight of which someone is going through. An example I would give is issues around sexual harassment, right? Like, you know, the show Mad Men used to always talk about like how it used to be, right? And it's like you had women literally suffering at the hands of men who would say, do, or, or, you know, kind of make women experience a thing however they chose to feel that way from a position of, of power. And it's not until you get to a point now where people are like, well, the Me Too thing is, is over aggressive. No, what it is is an expression of women uh, experiencing a frustration that they've always experienced. You know, over-sexualization, microaggressions in the workplace, you know, kind of domineering uh, patriarchal male, toxic masculinity, and all these other things, like that's real, you know? And so for black people who are experiencing this, for people who suffered at the hands of an unjust legal system, listen to what it is that they've experienced. Don't don't be so quick to ask the question like, well, what did you do? You know what I'm saying? Like, cause that's always something people like to do. Like, like, I, like it was your fault say, no matter what. Yeah, like, like, always, like you know, always. Toy and I live down south, right? And so we used to always be fearful and hate to harp on Pinecrest, but driving through Pinecrest used to be like a clinch up, lock in at 10 and 2 experience because mm -hmm. you knew that as a black person traveling to, to Richmond Heights or Homestead or wherever, coming from the beach, that that stretch of US 1 meant that you could be pulled over at any given point in time. To the point where George Bush's Department of Justice actually had to look at Pinecrest for being aggressive. It wasn't Before. even about Barack Obama. We're talking about Before like that. years and years and years of a police department just overly wow. aggressively pulling black people over to the point where they had to like take consideration. Same thing with Carl Gables. And I'm just calling on these folks, not to say that they're not trying to address the issue, but you have years and decades of this kind of behavior happening and only to a certain group of people. Yeah. I want, um, Toya, before you ask your other question, something I, I want to kind of summarize some of the things that were said because some people are taking notes on a lot of people. And uh, one of the things, Dwight, that you said, it, you're absolutely right. For our history, um, things would be great if you built my house for free and I didn't have to pay for it. It would be great for me, but it wouldn't be great for the person that had to build a house that didn't have a house. Uh, another situation is um, you're right. 
the old white men seem to have had a misunderstanding of the concept of what the word all meant. All would be inclusive of everyone. That would be black people, homosexuals, the LGBTQ, that would be women also. There was a lot of people that were left out of all. So a lot of people need to understand when the constitution and everything else was written and it said justice for all, all was not included when they wrote that. What they meant was all of us in this room that's writing it right now, we should benefit from it. All of our families should benefit from it. Not all of the humans that are actually in the United States of America at the time being. Um, another thing is, uh, why well, I, I just want to make sure I say that before we forget it. Everybody with the extremists, the Black Lives Matter, and Dwight made a good thing about um, sexual harassment. Mine has been more so based around breast cancer. If you don't understand BLM, consider it like breast cancer awareness. Uh, you don't go to breast cancer awareness and say, why are you using a pink ribbon? when I'm a man and I don't like the color pink. That's the color they chose to bring awareness to their campaign. You do not have to suffer breast cancer to understand the impact of breast cancer. If somebody in your family hasn't died for breast cancer, you still can understand the suffering of losing someone. If you can't take the mindset to empathize black people being fearful and dying at the hands of law enforcement, you probably couldn't process the fear of somebody dying from breast cancer just because you don't have it and it doesn't affect you doesn't mean it's not affecting the rest of the world. Also, you don't call the people at breast cancer awareness and tell them, hey, all cancers matter. Why are we only talking about breast cancer? The reason why you talk about breast cancer is the based off of research and you saw a historic amount of people dying from it and you needed to focus attention to that particular matter. If these things are too hard for you to comprehend, it's hard for me to say that you're either not ignorant or racist or you just want to have a conversation and a debate online, which I will continuously destroy you at because I use facts, not emotions. But I think we should be able to move on from that fact and understand this is just like breast cancer awareness. It's not just a group of people. It's multiple groups of people. And it is a movement to protect our people because we're dying just like people with breast cancer awareness. But I can't even take away from the pink. I'm just focusing on the black. That's what I'm doing. OK. All right. Go ahead, <laughs> right. So no, that's a good segue into what I was going to ask about, too. Right. Because we've been talking about police department and over policing. Right. So you may have a segment of people who don't wet, get it. They never been through it. But then you have a segment of people who know good and well how the police are used in the communities. And we've been calling them Karens. So I would love for y'all to just talk a little bit about that and how that can be addressed, right? Because you have people who are calling the police on purpose for no reason to come and enter into a situation that does not require the police. So Karen is always caring about, about shit that don't got nothing to do with her. <laughs> right. So oh, what can man. be done from a legislation perspective or what do we need to do to sort of begin to rectify that situation? Yeah. So when you, yeah. Oh. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was like, rock, paper, scissors? No. Um, <laughs> uh, so in New York, there's the Amy Cooper bill, which has been introduced I think, in the last couple of weeks, which basically uh, criminalizes using 911 uh, for racial animus, basically. Mm -hmm. So exactly, just to remind folks, Amy Cooper is the one who called the police on the African-American man who was bird watching in Central Park. Uh, you know, basically he was filming the entire uh, encounter where basically she's like, yeah, you call the police and I'm scared for my life. And he's like, dude, I'm watching the birds. Like I ain't even messing with you. I just told you to put your dog on a leash. <laughs> like that, that was the intent, the extent of the entire thing. So now uh, this Amy Cooper's law was going to make using 911 in this manner, a hate crime and escalate the penalties. So we would we need to do the same thing in Florida because I think at the end of the day, once you start to see criminal liability, that's when you see people start to kind of check their behaviors, right? Because the shaming on social media is one thing, right? You know, Amy Cooper, she was working for uh, some big brokerage house and mm -hmm. they let her go with the swiftness. Uh, you know, the, they took her dog away from her, which, you know, that probably hurt more than losing the job. And, you know, she, she suffered a lot of backlash, you know, online and all of that. The public shaming has its aspect, but at the same token, to be able to use the same criminal justice system that Karens were using as a weapon using it back against them, I think is a powerful message. And it really shows that we're really trying to get to the point where people are held accountable equally, as opposed to some people bearing the brunt of the system, but while others get to skate scot-free. And uh, so I'll use Florida as an example and, and why it's a little more murkier here, right? Uh, you take something like stay in your ground. 
uh, and we talk about weaponizing uh, a law, um, you know, stand your ground is rooted in fear, right? And if basically you can justify that the person uh, that was walking nearby or, or uh, near you, um, you know, scared you enough that you can use lethal force, people are getting away with 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 really what is murder. And so, uh, the reason why I pursued uh, reform to stand your ground, or at least uh, taking that that extracting that piece of the law out of statute uh, while I was in the legis legislature was really, that was at the root of it, was the perception that uh, black people and their skin color is weaponized, right? Like the mere fact that you being a dark hued individual, or you being too tall or too masculine or whatever, you know, too feminine in the case of trans women, like that somehow that in in itself is, is enough uh, our grounds for you to be murdered should not be the case, but this is some of the some of the reform that we need to pursue at the uh, at the state level, and that emphasize. I know we talked a lot about the criminal justice system and police reform and the state attorney, of course, but why you need to elect different state legislators, why you need to elect you know different mayors and city council people, is essential to understanding uh, and getting to the root of people knowing the diversity of the community that uh, they're you know, that they're creating laws in. Uh, I'll use Miami Beach as an example. Uh, I was walking through an exercise with some students. And of course, Miami Beach has no black elected officials on their on their city commission. Yet they keep running into these circumstances with their police and black people on the beach during their high impact weekends, Memorial Day, et cetera. Diversity matters. You know what I'm saying? If you have somebody who's from Miami Beach, who happens to be black and has happened to experience levels of discrimination, they're bringing a different attitude to that city commission when issues around police violence come up. Same thing with the state legislature. You know, you need more black people, you need more black women, you need a diversity of thought in terms of where people are coming from and the circumstances that they're experiencing. And then I would also caution my former colleagues and future colleagues in the state legislature to, if you're white, old, and from these rural areas, sit back, shut up, and listen to the experiences of those who've, who've walked in a different path than you, right? Because you walking around talking about how great it is to have 37 guns and you can do whatever you want to and how wonderful that is, is all from a position of privilege, a strong position of privilege that you and only you as an older white male possess in this country. So when women bring up issues around discrimination, when people of color bring up issues of discrimination, sit back, listen, and then more importantly, adjust your mindset to vote yes, to make sure that there are safeties and protections put in place for these communities. I think that comes with the uh, lack of ability to change the lenses of metrics of how people judge situations. Um, a lot of people still have a large lack of comprehension of equality and equity and the equitable things of what's going on in our society. But listening to some of the things you say, I just feel like it also comes from a place of just envy versus discriminatory practice, because the things you hate seems to be the things that people also admire the most. It's almost the person that is uh, driving a, a Honda and says they would never get a BMW, but they buy accessories to make their car look like a BMW. If you're not comprehending that, can't help you out. But, you know, people tanning, lip injections, extensions, everything else that people do to look like the people they so seem to hate so much. Um, and these were things, if you think about it, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, you didn't want to be too curvy. Now everybody wants to be curvy. You didn't want your lips too big. Now everybody wants, I mean, you literally have a whole thing that came up with social media, you know, the, the fish lips where people are literally puckering their lips up to try to have bigger lips. We went through a discrimination period as black people were, why are your lips so big? But now people want big lips. And I think I, I want some people to understand as you need to change your metrics, we as black people are able to change our metrics. We understand it is not just hate, it is envy. You must hate the things that you can't be like too fast, too smart, to whatever of anything that you can be. So you just start to hate those things because now you can't compete. 
but we have sympathy for you. So the surgeries were made so you could be like the things you hate, but we can't just change the law and we don't hate you. We just want the equality to be able to have, to have the same platform you have. There's no way anybody is going to win the race when you have a 165 year head start. There's no way anybody is going to win the race when as soon as you get to the starting line, somebody's holding you back. The advantages have to be taken away to make it a more equitable so we can have equity in the things that we've built within our society. And I think, Melba, you're giving us that opportunity. And it's one of those things where you can rarely say it, but you think of someone that is almost like the perfect candidate. So you're in an inter interracial relationship. So I think you have a immense understanding of being able to see both sides of the fence. You are a black woman, so you have to be one of the strongest human beings in, in the world in that position, which is accreditation that I give to my wife, that I give to Latoya, give to any woman that's around me. You're one of the strongest creatures ever. You work with ACLU, so you look at the basis of civil rights, but you also had to serve as a prosecutor, so you understand the people breaking the law, but as you break the law, I don't think you're just a, a horrible human being. I think that you can do better. If you look at the basis of what you have versus what I would assume would be someone named Kathy Rundle that probably couldn't understand the burnt ribs on a bone versus undercooked meat, because if she couldn't see that Darren Rainey was murdered and boiled alive, I'm just assuming I wouldn't want her on the grill. <laughs> if you look at the dynamics of who you are, versus what she is. And I think some people, pro and actually I've heard people say this to me. Actually, she's so dynamic, I didn't even know she was a Democrat. I thought she was a Republican. If the extremities are so different, how do you bring people to understand it's just time for a change because the results that are your best interest are not gonna happen with her in office? And that's the million dollar question, right? I mean, first off, it starts with social media education as led by Mike Hall and his specialty. But, you know, so there's the education component. And then it's also just like also just awareness, right? Because, again, so many people out of habit are like, I know this name. I'm going to check off this name because it's the same name I've seen for 27 years, right? And there's Top not that. Mind, top of ticket, yeah. Exactly. And it's just one of those things where it's just like you don't do that deeper dive of, as we should be doing for all our elected officials, what have they done in the last four years? Not even 27, just let's look at the last four, right? And that would include letting Jesus Menacal, who was sexually assaulting women and girls, as including underage girls and Hialeah off the hook, you know, the breaking of the huge scandal of how she basically has a slush fund with the Miami Foundation that she uses to pay off organizations built on the back of defendants forcing them to pay monies to be able to fund this racket. Yeah, and I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You know, the Miami Day Democratic Party basically pushing her out over her handling of the Darren Rainey case. If someone just hit Google and just did their due diligence looking at the last four years, I cannot come to the conclusion of how you would vote for her unless you, those things just don't bother you, as in like you just think you're kind of like a white extremist, right? Like <laughs> it's sort of like, how do you look at those things and just turn a blind eye and say, oh, well, you know, mistakes happen, right? It's, mm. it's you know, egregious after a while. So it's about getting people more interested and really just connecting this job with your day-to-day -day life. Even if you are not getting arrested, even if your loved ones haven't gotten arrested, even if you've never been the survivor of a crime, right? You should still care about the type of community you live in and what justice for all looks like, right? I mean, that is one of the key principles, you know, put forth by our founding fathers, granted with all of the issues about the, you know, the, the makeup of who the founding fathers were, right? But that's still, we haven't removed liberty and justice for all from our fabric, right? That That is something we still say, that is something we still recite, that's something we teach our kids. So obviously, if that's an aspirational goal, then we need to be doing all we can, each of us, to take steps towards making sure that justice is real and accessible for everyone. And the first step is to educate yourself and vote accordingly. So it's all about education and awareness. Dwight, I am glad you have pursued a different form of a political career, but I hope you stick with it. 
Uh, also, hope you get that six-figure salary you deserve at some point. You deserve uh, it, right? <laughs> you deserve it. So, I do want to lighten it up a little bit, although it is kind of sad because everything we have a reference to. So, I'm gonna play a little bit more, some more games, so we can leave people with a more positive note. Melba, I'm not gonna make you rap, but we are gonna reference some music things. <laughs> if you guys had to describe how you feel today with the song, what song would you choose? Uh, Rick Ross, Every Day I'm Hustling, because with 20 days left in the election, trust, every day, <laughs> I'm hustling, hustling. <laughs> White? Uh, I've been really feeling this uh, new Toby and Guigui song, so uh, try Jesus, don't try me, you know what I mean? <laughs> try Jesus. Because <laughs> I, I throw it. <laughs> All right, 2020 in its perpetuity from now until today, if you had to pick a song or a movie to describe 2020, what would that song or movie be? <laughs> Not the exhale. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll go first here. Um, so 2020 just feels like the entire Purge series of movies. <laughs> it does. And so, you know, I'll be I'll be le looking around corners, uh, you know, a little bit more. But I would say on a positive note that um uh, that the song though that keeps kind of popping back up in terms of that is uh, "We Gonna Be Alright" by Kendrick Lamar. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, like right, uh, right. we we've, we've suffered through things like this before. Whether it was you know 1918 flu, whether it was civil rights, whether it was you know world wars, uh, you know. We, we've made it through uh, as human beings, but what's always been uh, paramount is coming out of it with a greater sense of humanity. Like, you know, at, after each one of those circumstances, there's always been a push towards a greater and larger humanity. And so we need to like check in with one another a little bit more. So we're going to be all right by Kendrick. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, actually speaking to Exhale, uh, you know, the theme song for Waiting to Exhale by Whitney Houston. Uh, because you think about the one lyric that comes to my mind, when you've got friends who wish you well, there comes a point where you exhale, right? So at, at the end of the day, like for me, 2020 has been about the incredible support of friends and family to help me on this crazy journey of running for office. You know, the fact that you have friends and family to help you get through this pandemic, right? Even though you can't see each other, you know, you, you guys are pushing each other, you're texting, you're having Zoom happy hours or Zoom trivia nights, and you know you, you're relying on your friends to kind of help you keep your mental health, you know, mental health, keep your mental state up, keep you hopeful. And then you're also waiting to exhale because we're like, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Is this going to be okay? Is this going to be okay? And there will be a point where we can finally exhale because we can't hold our breath for all of 2020, right? But right. I think it's going to come a point where we exhale, whether it be after you know, August 19th for me, the election is August 18th. So the next day, August 19th, I'm going to be exhaling for sure. Um, but also maybe we'll all be collectively exhaling in November after the presidential election and we see how things shake out, right? And we, you know, kind of know what we're going into 2021 with. We'll be able to exhale when there's a vaccine or at least we have a, a, a better mindset around how we can keep ourselves safe from the virus. So yeah, that whole concept of really exhaling and being able to be free is kind of what's resonating with me today on 2020. Yeah. Go ahead, Toya, share that last thought for us. Yeah, no, so I just wanted to say thank you both for joining us today, because we had a really good conversation. I'm sure we're gonna have many more, because <laughs> like you said, November is right around the corner and there's so much that needs to be talked about with that. And August as well, you know? So definitely thank you both for joining us today. It's been a really good conversation. Melba, all I ask is, uh... Once you become state attorney, you come back and do our November session with us, uh, oh, with Dwight, because we got to go down ballot as Dwight has helped us do to educate people. Um, we want people to understand, try to have fun. We, we try to keep it as authentic as possible, but we definitely want to educate people. Uh, don't forget, August 18th is an open primary um for miami-dade county there has been some misinformation it's not a closed primary that is an open primary on august 18th uh hope you've sent me your application go ahead 
always got to make a distinction. In Melba's race, it is definitely an open primary, but in some, there will be some races that appear on certain people's ballots and others that won't. So partisan primaries for like uh, state rep uh, candidates that are running only as Democrats will only be on the Democratic ballot. And same thing with Republicans who are only running in Republican primaries. But in the case of Melba's race, because there is no Republican or a right an opponent, everybody gets a chance to vote, and I hope they vote accordingly. Trust the dreads. I'm just gonna say it. www.melbaformiami.com. I'm number 24 on the ballot. Um, definitely learn more about me on the website. Donate if you can, because hey, 20 days, listen, it's the final right. push. And if y'all haven't captured that number twenty four, just like Kobe, it's Melba mentality. Uh, the yes. black Melba Melba mentality is here to make it happen. So uh, let's do that, guys. Thank you very much, Toya. So happy to have you back. Congratulations on your second round with HSN and all the great work you're doing with cosmology. Thank you. Um, we cheering for everybody black and everybody that's just trying to do something positive. So no racism. Like Pla said, I am not a racist. I just want to see everybody win. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you guys very much. And this is Tech Beats and Bites. Bye. Thank you.